Good morning, and welcome to the Safe Streets Coalition meeting. How many do we have here today that this is their first meeting? Several? Good. Thank you. And if you would like to become a member, I have a form over by the drinks. Uh, just fill it in, and we'll be sure and get your email and everything uh, ready so I can send you information. I would like to introduce uh, the staff of Shawnee Regional Prevention Recovery Services. We have our executive director, Michelle Voth. We have Lynn Smith. We have Dave A. Uh, Satilho. And I'm Judy Wilson, office manager. <laughs> Okay, if you would take just a few minutes, there is a yellow form in the middle of your table. If you would please sign in. And there's also a small golden rod half sheet there. If you would fill that in before the end of the meeting. And if you have any suggestions about the meeting, would you just please list those? That helps us a lot. Today we have a champion of character, and we'd like to invite Cindy Patton to come forward. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our champion of character. His name is John Bursaw, and if you would come forward, sir. And then also I'd like the Character Recognition Council to come forward. Thank you. and. Uh, I think Sheriff Hill was going to come up too. Is he still here? There he is. Yeah. Come on up. And we have Sergeant Wilson here. Okay. And uh, to make this award, he was nominated by Ron Brown. So I'm going to have Ron go ahead and tell you why he made this nomination. Well, John is a tremendous human being. Uh, he does so much for the community. He's one of those quiet heroes who just works constantly to improve the community. And so uh, my primary reason for nominating him was the Youth Leadership Conference that he has been the chair of for a number of years and has affected numerous youth, not only in Topeka, but Shawnee County uh, in the two-day conference that we do. And so with that, I'd like to read the Character Award. <clears throat> the Kansas Character Recognition Council of Topeka, Shawnee County recognizes John Bursall as the strength of our nation is dependent upon the health and safety of its communities the strength of our community is dependent upon the characters of its citizens. Topeka City of Character and Safe Streets Coalition of Topeka of Shawnee County recognizes John Bursaw. John is an outstanding indiv individual who has served and continues to serve in his community in a variety of ways. He serves as a tribal leader of the Potawatomi tribe, retired as a colonel in the United States Air Force, and annually hosts the Youth Leadership Conference for area high school students. John's commitment to our youth is exceptional in that he plans, funds, and oversees a two-day conference on leadership during spring break. This conference has provided training to hundreds of young people in our community. Demonstrating generosity and loyalty makes John Bursaw a champion of character. Thank you. Down here and shake these people's hands here. And if you'd like to say something, would you like to say something, John? I've been asked a couple of times already this morning, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, nothing, I'm retired. But I think my wife will take exception to that. I, you know, I'm very busy, but I enjoy just everything I do. And uh, I want to extend a personal thank you to Ron Brown for this nomination. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Be sure and continue to give us nominations and so if you have a nomination for a champion of character, get that to Safe Streets and they will be glad to um, process those and hopefully we'll have your nominee be a champion of character. Okay, we need to do a little business here. 
you probably received the May minutes that were that uh, we sent out. Could I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. The minutes have been approved. We have a staff update. Um, we have two meetings that are coming up. We have a retailers meeting on June the 12th, and we also have the National Night Out uh, planning meeting. This will be our third planning meeting. It will be at the library at 6.30 on June the 20th. So if you do not have a National Night Out planned already, please see me and I'll be glad to help you with that. Also, you might just like to come to the meeting because we have a lot of, of support. Our sponsors will be there and also a lot of good ideas from the neighborhoods. So again, plan to come to the Topeka Shawnee County Library. That would be June the 20th at 6.30 and we're in room 101 B and C. As of this time, we have 66 neighborhoods already registered for National Night Out. Last year we had a total of 87 in August, and of course we're just now going into June. So we would like to have 100 total neighborhoods for this year. You have a flyer on the table that will show a new neighborhood watch sign. The police department will be purchasing these. So look for them in your neighborhood. If you don't have a neighborhood watch meeting already scheduled, please see me and we'll be glad to come out and help you organize one. We would like to thank our sponsors uh, for our national night out. We have the Topeka, Topeka Police Department, the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office, and also the District Attorney, and they're a great help for us each year. We do have our partner updates now, and Sergeant Wilson will be coming up for the Topeka Police Department. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Sergeant Wilson with the Topeka Police Department, Community Policing, West Topeka. Um, first slide here is city violent crime. As you guys can expect, you know, with the weather warming up, people have been a lot more active. Um, some of our violent crime is up a little bit, but if you can look at month to month, um, some of the, it's pretty much a break even there. Um, kind of like that neighborhood watch sign says, if you see something, say something. You know, if we don't know it then we can't respond and we can't help you guys out <clears throat> so just do our your part and help us we need all everybody in this room and everybody in Topeka to help us uh, fight the crime second slide is city property crime um, there's a lot more low numbers there which is obviously a good sign um, again with school out kids are out and about all the the sun's out so all our people are coming out um, some of those numbers are going to increase like I said, if you see something, say something, you know, lock it, remove it, or lose it. We can't stress that enough, especially overnight with our burglaries and car burglaries. Um, also, remember, guns in cars is not a good idea. Um, if you're a gun owner, be responsible, lock it up, take it inside. A couple slides here on some of the stuff we've been involved in here in the last few weeks. Um, the Topeka Police Department. Uh, East Community Policing started a PAL chess program with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, a lot of, we were able to bring in a lot of new kids that, you know, maybe sports isn't their thing, but they wanted to learn about chess. Uh, Officer Bracken was instrumental in that and had a great first season. And then uh, just last week we had the law enforcement torch run. Um, all different agencies from around Shawnee County in this area. Took, play, took part in that. Um, it leads up, they do the torch run, and then that weekend is when the uh, state law for, or the uh, state Special Olympics track meet is held down in Wichita. So, pretty special event. This was the 50th year for that event down there, and a great way for us to be involved in a, a wonderful charity. So, keep
keep up all the good work, keep calling us, and help us out with our community. Captain Acre from the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office. Captain Acre with the Sheriff's Office. I'm going to talk a little bit about updates on what we currently have going on with the Sheriff's Office. So um, everybody noticed today the sun's out, so the weather's getting nicer. Hopefully we're done with some rain for a while. Um, with the nice weather comes an uptick in some of our criminal activity. So how do we address that as law enforcement? We've started kind of forming some little task force, if you will, within the Sheriff's Office, um, micro-policing efforts. What we'll do there is we'll take our fugitive warrants unit and we'll task them with meeting up with our patrol division and we'll form our own little teams and we're going to start serving warrants outside of the normal hours where we serve them. So we're going to address the criminal element that's already been in the system. With that, we're also looking at purchasing some equipment. One of those pieces of equipment is called the LSAG. What that is, it's an automatic license plate reader. We're going to put that into use where we're going to start monitor and gleaning some information on our known criminals that are coming through Shawnee County on the major highways and byways. So how does this play into our community? Using that information, we're going to start addressing the drug interdiction, the criminal interdiction, as well as the human trafficking that we all know comes right through our county. So with that, we're going to focus our efforts on addressing those criminal elements as they're occurring real time in Shawnee County. So what can we get from you guys? It goes back to the see something, say something. If something's out of the ordinary or you see it, call us. We have that equipment. We can put it in your neighborhoods. If you see those suspicious vehicles, call us. We can put those in your neighborhoods. We can use that information to develop our uh, top 10 list if you want. We can start cross-analyzing data, looking at uh, a crime analysis position on what we can do, and then we can take more of a proactive step instead of waiting to just report the incidents after the fact. Um, the other thing that sunshine brings is warm weather. Be sure as the weather's climbing, we're paying attention to our animals, our family, and our friends. If you know somebody without air conditioning, let somebody know. We don't want anybody having a heat stroke or heat exhaustion due to the excessive heat. Pets, if you see pets locked inside of vehicles, contact the city, contact us. Let us send our animal control out and deal with that so that we don't have uh, any unnecessary incidents as a result of the weather. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Michelle Voth will be up next. She'll introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. It's almost afternoon, I guess, now. I um, wanted to highlight one thing before I go on to uh, our next part of our program, but on the, on, uh, you'll see a program report, and this describes some of the activities that both Safe Streets and its host agency, Prevention and Recovery Services, has been involved in in the last month. And do want to shout out that we have a substance abuse task force that meets on a monthly basis, and our next meeting's June 20th. We're always encouraging people to uh, attend if you're interested in that area, and if you are interested, give me a holler after the after the meeting. Also, been really involved in some Latino activities, and one of the most successful things that more recently was the Coffee with a Cop um, and Vitamin Industry. Um, Dave Sotelo was one of our staff members that was there, and um, he's bilingual, and it's, um, it was a, a, a great event. Um, wanted to also tell you that you know a little over a year ago. Uh, Prevention Recovery Service and Safe Streets partnered with Freedom Now uh, to look at the issue of human trafficking. And as a result, we've had lots of meetings here, had lots of discussions, and currently this, uh, the Freedom Now staff is in California at a conference. And so our next plan, July, we will not have a meeting, but in August and September, that will be the follow-up of some of the, the learnings from all the work that the task forces and committees have done. And then at the September meeting, we'll also, they'll be rolling out an action plan. So we're excited for that to happen. But as we transition from the focus on human trafficking, we wanted to look at what are, what are interests of this group. And so every 
meeting, you'll see those orange sheets and we ask if you're interested in any other uh, topics or whatever. So we've looked at that and um, opioids was really the number one uh, topic that came up over and over again. So that's what we're, we decided to, to do today to talk about that. And the timing is great because PARS recently got a grant from Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And if you go to the theater anytime this summer, you should see a PSA on opioids. And on, on your table, this is hot off the press as of today, um, it's a, an information sheet about, that, that talks about opioids, what they are, um, signs and symptoms if someone is in trouble, what kind of questions should you ask your doctor. Um, so it's a, a really inf a good informational piece we hope that you'll be able to share, um, and we'll be doing that this summer. So in addition to that, um, when we talked about when you wanted to have somebody come speak about opioids, somebody asked me if I had a hard time finding a speaker. And I told them that I um, just Googled Topeka opioids. <laughs> Not user, but expert. So um, <laughs> so um, I did ask my husband, you know, full disclosure here. And I should know all of this about him, but I really don't. So I'm going to give an introduction so you will know him a little bit better. Um, Dr. Voth, Eric, is a specialist in internal medicine, pain management, addiction medicine, and, and is vice president of primary care at Stormont Vale. He serves as an advisor on alcohol and drug abuse issues to the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts, is a former member of the National Advisory Committee for the Center of Substance Abuse Treatment and of Health and Human Services, and more recently, he served on the Kansas Prescription Drug Abuse and Opioid Advisory Committee, and this group developed recommendations for a four-year state plan that's uh, being implemented as we speak. He's recognized internationally, and I know that because he travel. He used to travel a lot, not so much anymore, and he, tra and he lectures on all kinds of policy issues, but today he'll talk about opioids. He works on this issue um, in his daily, his day to day life, and what, and he will give us kind of a, a physician's perspective on the issue. So, please help me welcome Dr. Eric Booth. It's a heck of a thing when uh, someone doing introductions can say they woke up next to the speaker <coughs> overnight, <laughs> but that's a fact. A uh, little bit of background about me. I've been here uh, since 1984, opened the Chemical Dependence Services. <laughs> That's great timing, isn't it? At St. Francis when I first came to town. And it was actually that involvement that got me paying close attention to the whole prescribing thing because there were clearly people that came that were abusing drugs, other people that had been kind of characterized as drug abusers, but maybe it's because someone had stopped their drugs abruptly and they had withdrawal symptoms. And then there were those docs that were just writing huge prescriptions for stuff. And I figured that somewhere in there we needed to tease out what was really going on. So actually the first paper I wrote on it was 1991 uh, talking about appropriate prescribing of controlled substances. Well over time, as we've seen, uh, this has gotten to be a bigger and a bigger problem and I'm going to paint the picture that the opiates, while a tremendous issue, are part of this overall drug abuse scene that we've got to get a handle on in the country. Because if we don't, you know, we're just like the guy that's, you know, going around trying to pour cups of water on a big uh, forest fire, when in fact we need to be figuring out where things are coming from and how people are getting to the place that they're abusing drugs. So I'm going to step over because. <laughs> These slides are a little tricky to see, but I do point some things out on there that might be useful to you. So we all know there's an epidemic. It's changed a bit over the last few years, uh, but one very clear pattern is that all forms of opiates have increased drastically. Now fortunately, in the last couple of years, we've seen a smoothing of, uh, some, of the, some of the forms of opiate overdoses particularly like oxycontin, hydrocodone, et cetera. Heroin has actually been a little more stable uh, than s the synthetics, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, uh, are up quite a bit. And this rise was underway for quite some time, but what really blew the horn on it is when the carfentanil started rolling in from uh, across the borders and killing people, just bang, they're down. All of a sudden, at least I was being called, 
down to Florida, East Coast, Southeast, like what the hell's going on down here? People are dying like flies. And it turned out, as you all know, being in law enforcement, a lot of this was uh, folks trying to get an edge on the price of the narcotics, cutting heroin with carfentanil, and carfentanil is just phenomenally deadly. Now, the sad story here is that we are still seeing increases uh, <clears throat> in the last couple of years in the carfentanil deaths, and it kind of looks like this. This is off the CDC website. Uh, these are the areas that are still seeing the significant rises in, uh, in the opiate fatalities. Now, a couple of things. It's great to live in Kansas. Yay, I'm a lifelong Kansan. But here's another good reason to live in Kansas. We have one of the lowest opiate overdose uh, deaths in the country. And in fact, a while very recently, we had the only actual decrease in emergency opioid uh, uh, reports of anywhere in the country. <clears throat> Now, we don't live in a vacuum, imagine. Nobody in here would ever think that, right? What we do see going on nationally is that there is a broad, broad use of drugs. Marijuana has been running rampant and seems to be running so rampant that few people are paying attention to it anymore, but they should be, because I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. We had this huge effort that was pushed by the Joint Commission on hospital accreditation called the fifth vital sign. Stamp out pain, do whatever it takes to get rid of pain. And guess what? <clears throat> because that was accrediting our hospitals, guess what the doctors and providers did? They stamped out pain and were just writing scripts willy-nilly for this. Um, <clears throat> we had a lot of availability of, of opiates. We also had, and we still do not have, a national prescription monitoring process, and we've had typically pretty poor communication between the medical world and the law enforcement world. And what I've always tried to do in Kansas, and, and particularly in Topeka, because I've had close relationships with law enforcement, is to say, if you see patterns, let me know. If one of my prescribers, and I, I supervise 150 primary care docs, if you see a pattern if my docs or uh, nurse practitioner's prescriptions are showing up in your busts, I want to know about it. And I'll talk a little bit more of that in a moment because particularly at Stormont, but a lot of organizations are really now working rigorously on this, on this whole issue. So what you really see in the, the overdose issue is kind of these three big areas. The first one being you know, regular old drug abusers moving on, moving up the ladder, starting on marijuana years ago, getting their Percocet, moving on up the ladder, and then <clears throat> getting illegal drugs, illegal drugs cut with carfentanil, or some sort of a pill mill, and one of the things happening there is shifting around among the opiates, because not all opiates are alike, and some are rapidly fatal and others not so much. Then some overdoses with pain patients, especially being moved from a short-acting uh, opiate to long-acting uh, opiate. Um, mistakes being made with a legitimate prescription, unclear advice about how to take it, people not getting rid of, of opiates that they have not used, and a kid or a grandkid getting into it. And then, excuse me, uh, interactions with other medications, and this is a subtlety that's way beyond the scope of what we're doing, but for instance, one of the psychiatric medications that's commonly prescribed for bipolar illness, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, will literally turn methadone fatal often. So those kinds of things have to be known. And then the last one, which is tragic, oh, overdoses for suicide. Somebody says, into the roads today, I'm killing myself. But as you can see, it's not as simple as those darn doctors writing too many scripts for opiates. It's a very complex, broader social issue. Now, the other thing that we've got to look at as a community and as a country is we've got to look at how and when young people are being exposed to drugs of abuse. Here's why. If you look at the brain development, so this is roughly about you know, two to five years old, the cerebellum, when kids first learn to throw a ball, 
or dribble a, ba a basketball, or walk for that matter, or run, then you see a little bit older, like around six to 10, maybe 12, where <clears throat> the, the motivation centers start to kick in. And that's a point when people start to say, hmm, I want to go play with Johnny. I want to go play soccer. These are things I want to be doing. And then at about 12 to 15 or 16, you start to get development of the part of the brain that drives emotion. Oh, I love Billy. I love Johnny. I want to go spend time with them. So at what age is the average age of initiation for alcohol or marijuana in Kansas? I bet somebody knows that in this crowd. 12? Nationally, it's 12. That's right here. So that's as the brain's developing, not fully developed, and the part of the brain that is slow to develop and does not develop until about age 24 is the prefrontal cortex. That is the modulator of behavior. That's that part that stops and says, and some people never develop that. You know, I've been accused of that, admittedly, but some people, it's earlier, maybe 20 if we're lucky, some people way later. But if you think about all of this drug exposure going on down here, that's way before the brain is fully ready to get into that or be exposed to drugs. Now, another social phenomenon that I want to talk about, and those of you that have known me for more than a year or two know that about the last 40 years that I've been lecturing, I've spent a lot of time paying attention to marijuana because I am absolutely convinced that alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco are the place where this whole business gets started. And this goes back to when I was running around on the streets, and I won't even admit <coughs> what I was doing in those years, but that was 1973, 4, and 5. And if you look at what happened then, we had some of the highest marijuana use ever seen before or since. And that was the active 70s, like 77, 78, 79. And then it dropped off, and then around 1990s, early 90s, when Clinton, of course, hadn't inhaled, uh, came in and made a whole bunch of drug law changes, we saw the second spike beginning to happen. And you say, well, so? Well, here's the use of heroin in that same period of time. And it's interesting, and these are, I'm sorry, these are non-heroin narcotics. If you look at how things worked out, here was that marijuana spike back in the 70s, and about two years later, you start to see another spike, and then the 90s, and another spike, and that has held true with heroin and methamphetamine all the way through. Marijuana goes up, a year or two later, you'll see heroin and uh, methamphetamine go up. And then, you can look at things like the effect of some of our legal decisions, like legalizing marijuana in Colorado. This is the incidence of heroin overdose deaths in Colorado. And there have been a few people that have tried to contend that legalizing pot actually reduced heroin overdoses, like right up in here. And what's interesting, though, is that the, the uh, legislature in the same year in Colorado had a requirement, <clears throat> requirement that all physicians that prescribe any kind of opiate must be registered in their medication registry. <clears throat> and guess what? Opiate deaths started to drop. But that was also the same year they legalized marijuana. And so the marijuana advocates said, see there, we made marijuana, or we made overdose deaths drop, but never talked about some of the other things going on. If you think there's a difference, <clears throat> yay, Kansas again. Here are the Kansas statistics on overdose deaths. Here are the Colorado statistics. Medical marijuana, first blip, this continued, 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 and then marijuana was legalized, and this, this uh, line just continues to rise. And I've analyzed these of all the CDC data, every state, every state that's legalized, and there's a few that have kind of hinky data but the bottom line is there is a pretty darn close connection there. Okay, so that's the social side of the picture. We've gotten more liberal about drug use, more accepting, some places are now legalizing psilocybin mushrooms. Holy cow, if you don't think that's gonna be a problem. Any of your law enforcement officers that have had to deal with somebody that's on LSD or PCP, just wait, psilocybin's coming. 
But the reality is, some people have really terrible pain, and some people need opiates. And sometimes we don't progress correctly as we're treating patients. So this is a definition that I've used for a long time, that if we're talking about how to appropriately handle opiates, it's to prescribe a reasonable dose of medications that are known to be effective to the correctly chosen patients in a manner that's carefully monitored and that demonstrates improvement in their status. The reason I highlight those is there's a tendency to just write a prescription here, go take this, and come back in a couple of months, see how it goes. And that person may have had a history of alcoholism or a history of marijuana use or whatever, and you're adding opiates to it, and now what have you just done? You've just set that patient up for abuse. We've got to remember that pain has a lot of different tentacles to it. It's not just simply, oh, my back hurts so much. Uh, there's the physiological side, the injury, of course, car wrecks, traumas, just having a bad back. Um, <clears throat> but then there are psychological elements, big psychological elements. People that have underlying psychiatric disease, bipolar illness, etc. cetera. Uh, and pain can certainly exacerbate some of those and vice versa. And then the social elements, gosh, you know, secondary gain or not being able to work because you have so much pain you're declared disabled. Uh, I've seen a number of the more seamy sides of this, like a patient taking a prescription for oxycodone, adding sex to it, and being able to trade that all for cocaine. Sounds like a reasonable trade, right? Well, no, not so much, because it's my prescription being used on the street as commerce, for heaven's sakes. And when you have a big homeless, we don't have a huge homeless population, but some, Drugs do become that element of commerce that we've got to be sensitive to. Now, <clears throat> the prescribing physicians or, or nurse practitioners or whatever often catch a lot of grief because of handing out all these opiates. But one of the things that I see as much of a problem is handing out short-acting opiates versus using longer-acting opiates that have more of a therapeutic effect. And here's why. This is what happens with short-acting opiates. Typically, about half of their therapeutic amount hits the, hits the brain, hits the system, and disappears in about two to four hours. So that person goes from pretty good pain control to still a lot of pain, and there are these big gaps in time. The other thing that happens is when they take that short-acting medicine, they get a buzz. I don't know if you've ever taken Lortab or Oxycodone, but you take that, and <clears throat> an hour later, you're like, oh, I feel pretty good. Well, double that, triple that, quadruple that. You can see then how they get this cycle going. But what happens if we use the long-acting opiates that are built this way? It's a much smoother curve. There's better pain control, and they don't tend to bounce around from high to no control. The problem is, if a person's been used to getting short-acting meds, and I give them a long-acting med, and they go, yeah, but I, I really like it when I get that little buzz, and they keep increasing their dose, or they crush it, or they snort it, now you've got an overdose where you maybe have 10, 20 times the amount of opiate, and, and I didn't do my job in instructing the patients about, wait a minute, let's, you know, don't cross over that way. So that's something that needs a lot of attention. An area that I really emphasize, and it's so important that we understand, is the difference between dependence, physical dependence, and addiction. And there is a fundamental difference there. If anybody in this crowd takes an opiate for long enough, you're going to develop a physical dependence on it. And if I just stop it, you're going to have withdrawal symptoms, you're going to you know, salivate, your hair is going to stand up in your arms, etc. And that doesn't feel good. But if tapered slowly, that won't happen. The flip side is that continues then, and on top of it, you see behavioral stuff. Selling the drugs, taking more than was prescribed, saving it up and using it on the weekends to party with. And that's where you get the addictive or abusive behaviors. And the, pro the reason I bring this up is over and over and over in the national literature, you'll hear about Everybody that takes opiates gets addicted to them. It's like, hold the show, that's not accurate. There will be a physical dependence syndrome, but not everybody 
that takes an opiate will be an addict. So, what are some, some things that we can do to try to stem the tide of a lot of this? Well, we, being the, the healthcare community, needs to look closely at how we are managing pain and how we're managing opiates. And the Centers for Disease Control came up with a whole bunch of, well, 12 guidelines on things that we, providers, need to be doing to watch as we prescribe opiates to be sure we're doing it safely. We need to be sure that it's the right choice for a patient. We need to be sure that they have some goals and, and clear guidance. Um, we need to start with short-acting medications and be sure that we've exhausted all these other things and start with low doses and don't give out unlimited supplies. I've done a lot of reviewing for the Board of Healing Arts and honest to God, there would be cases where a doc would write 90 Valium, PRN refill for a year, and the physical exam was a check mark. It's like, you suppose somebody maybe ought to get in trouble for that kind of thing. So, then there needs to be a reevaluation period. Uh, we need to assess whether people are having any kind of side effects, and we need to review the pharmacy, the, the prescription monitoring programs, which we have in Kansas, uh, drug screens episodically, and then avoid medications uh, that can cause cross-reaction. So what we've done at Stormont, uh, we've, we've actually initiated a, an opiate stewardship committee that's been going for about a year now, <clears throat> and we're looking at every element of our use of opiates, both inpatient and outpatient. And uh, we're doing a number of things, but these are among what we're doing. First of all, we have a pain agreement that most of the patients are being asked to sign that walks through the side effects, what we expect, that we will drug test, that we will not just, you know, haul out medications to them. Uh, we are in the process of building systems to help our docs check K-TRAX, which is our prescription monitoring system, and to get that, that, those statistics back to me so that I can say, hey docs, you're not doing a good enough job monitoring this, so get after it. We drug screen patients at least annually. <clears throat> we have pain scoring tools to tell if they're actually getting some benefits. Uh, we openly and regularly use consultation with other like surgeons, neurosurgeons, et cetera. We very carefully watch what medications are used together. And we use templates in our electronic medical record to try to document really carefully. Uh, background checks are a little bit of a sticky wicket because you're crossing into a legal arena there and I'm not adverse to it, but it's harder and it is a, it's a, it's just a, a really time consuming thing. <clears throat> what we try to do is encourage our patients and our providers to encourage patients to first of all, minimize opiates. You know, there are other things to treat pain with. Can work, but certainly minimize them. Lock your medications. Grandparents and parents are one of the top sources of opiates for kids. Simply, oh, well, I had a kidney stone, I got a few left, I'll just toss it in the cabinet. And Johnny comes through to visit, and guess what Johnny's now got in his pocket to walk off with? Dispose of unused medications. As Michelle was mentioning, we're working on a program and be pushing us out soon with, with uh, physician offices to send home these little kits that uh, excess medications can be put into, uh, water added, shake it up, and it destroys the medication. Uh, Stormont is just now uh, beginning to roll out a take back that will allow anybody that hits our system at any point in the system to have these big containers that meds can be tossed in and it destroys the meds. And that's not yet implemented, but hopefully coming soon. Um, again, take medications only as prescribed. If one makes you feel good, don't take two. You know, don't take four. And for gosh sakes, don't drink on top of it. Report side effects or strange sensations. Oh, my husband passed out after taking his medicine. Do you think I should give him another dose? Gee, maybe we ought to talk about that. Or maybe you want him to take another dose. But don't tell me about that one. And then <clears throat> report those side effects. And for folks that are particularly on significant doses, involve family members. Because some of the doses that folks are on are really high and can be fatal. 
And if a person's having side effects, you've got to be ready to administer Narcan or uh, call uh, emergency services. So this is a tricky area, and we're all out there swimming with the big fish, and if you're going to swim with the big fish, you better be ready because the big fish have teeth. And the reality of it is um, we have a huge problem that is going to be slow to turn around. We're seeing some turn around, but for heaven's sakes, look at the big picture, the whole picture of drug and alcohol use and, of course, the opiates. And I am open for questions. pain management clinics here in Shawnee County specifically for uninsured and then people who fall below the poverty line and so in excluding those who don't qualify for Medicare Medicaid and are not enrolled in affordable care what options are there <laughs> the question is are there options for uninsured and those that don't don't uh, qualify for Medicaid Medicare uh, for actual pain management systems and I don't think we have any I, I hate to say that but I mean and we've got some folks that are working on methadone but that's not the same thing I mean a comprehensive pain management so epidural injections physical therapy all that kind of stuff does not exist uh, to the best of my knowledge for that arena now I know a lot of us are looking at you know how can we provide more of that care that's expensive care but maybe it can be done in, in some select uh, way, shapes, or form. So to your knowledge, um, are there established pain management clinics that are there? Are there established pain management resources that contribute to health access and other um, kind of charity type solutions here in Shawnee County? Right. right now, that is a hole. And I know for a fact they're working on trying to find some ways to, to uh, increase that. In Adina, do you have? <laughs> Relative to health access, having coverage for pain management programs, I don't think so, but you're the boss. <laughs> One of the things that we've run into, too, um, in the indigent population, we, we have what we call the care clinic that's focused on indigent care, people that have typically um, no-showed for appointments a lot, super high-risk folks. And uh, boy, that's a tough, tough population because if you even sort of start to think about using opiates, and a lot of times they vanish back into the street and use it as and use it as you know commerce. So you're really trying hard to not give opiates, and then it's like, well, come for a couple visits and don't show back up. So it's it's a that's a tough tough population, but trying at least. There are no methadone clinics. There are some providers that have prescribed uh, methadone or suboxone, and. Um, but as far as a well-organized methadone dispensing program, uh, I do not. I don't think we have any. Oh, wait a minute.
And I think to your question, you were asking about methadone programs, right, or narcotic programs. And there used to be, I'm aware of two providers that do, I'm going to say methadone treatment. I'm unwilling to recommend either one. Um, and that's mainly because I haven't had enough real face-to-face -to, -face to say, but I do hear funny stories. And so that's unfortunate. But, and I hear funny stories anyway, but not so funny sometimes. I saw another hand. Uh, yeah, Ron. Okay. Obviously, from your presentation, Kansas is doing a much better job with regard to opioids. I know a lot of states are suing uh, the major drug manufacturers. In your opinion, what are we doing well here and need to continue doing to keep, to keep a lid on the opioid crisis? Well, I think one of the things that's been really good in Kansas is a huge amount of our health care is, is undertaken on the part of large organizations. So if you look around Kansas at the hot spots, they tend to be sort of the little mom and pop clinics, that kind of thing. Uh, Stormont is all over this. I mean, we're watching it like a hawk. Wichita, watching closely. Obviously, Kansas City. Um, I think in some of our communities, we like in the southeast part of the state, a lot of problems. And one of the other problems is Missouri doesn't have a, a, tr a tracking system, physician or a prescription monitoring system. So it's real easy to go back and forth in the southeast part of the state there. So that's a problem. Um, we've, we've had a lot of things going on around the state, like our program here, trying to keep people attuned and do things and be a, attentive to the community, and maybe we're just lucky, you know? A lot of times the bad stuff slows as it gets in from the coast and stops about Colorado and, and eastern Missouri and then goes and then changes. It doesn't ever go away, but some of it may be luck, but I think we've got excellent law enforcement and, you know, Law enforcement's all over this, so yay, and and a lot of school efforts. So yes, I think we've done a lot of good things in Kansas. Dr. Vo, thank you for being here today. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come speak to us about this. During your presentation, during your presentation, you talked about a correlation that occurred in Colorado between legalization of marijuana and a spike one to two years later in overdose deaths. Was that opioids generally, or was that any, was that fentanyl, heroin, all of them combined? What are we talking about? Both opiate and heroin overdose deaths. And in your research, have you found any other correlations between the legalization of marijuana and a spike in use of uh, illicit or illegal drugs? Yeah, the question was um, the use of marijuana in states and other spikes of illicit drugs. <coughs> One of the problems we'd have is, is our monitoring across the country is spotty. I mean, there's a lot of states that just do nothing uh, or very, very shaky sp uh, research or monitoring. Uh, there have been, like, behavioral things, for instance, like car accidents, uh, fatal car accidents going up, um, and e increased use among young people of marijuana-related things. But then to make a connection on to, to the other drugs is tricky because there's almost always a lag, and it's really hard to do an absolute one-to-one. -one. When you look at all the states, though, and it's kind of shocking, you, you start to see these trends. And it would be very difficult to, you know, in a peer-reviewed magazine like New England Journal to say, I've found the answer, because it's just not that easy. But there is clearly a trend. And in some states, like Colorado, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, a clear trend in opiate deaths, whether heroin or non-heroin opiate deaths, and the legalization of marijuana. Could you um, paint us a picture of what your typical opiate abuser looks like as far as demographics, so street or legal? Sure. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had at least 15 to 20 opiate abusers that just like to roll right in and look like a normal person. Oh, sexy. Yeah, let's see what happens. Would you like some oxycodone? 
And that's how, I mean, it, it's tricky. And, you know, abusers that are really good at it, that have been at it for a while, they, they can paint incredible stories. And <clears throat> I had an abuser that was probably 35, 36 once that said she was dying from pancreatic cancer and even had the CT scan to prove it. And I was stunned. I said, that's terrible. You've got this terrible, awful thing. And then I noticed it was from the VA. And then I thought, wait a minute now, how did a young woman get a VA CT scan? And turned out that she had a friend in the VA radiology department that took a CT scan off of an old guy, male, who did have pancreatic cancer and was dying from it. And she was carrying around getting all these prescriptions. So, I mean, you, you really have to listen. You got to pay attention. And it is tough to sort out sometimes. That's me. Right. Well, there, there are studies about that. The neat thing about these take-back units is they actually destroy the drug. So they don't get just taken and then tossed in the landfill. It, there's an enzymatic thing that actually destroys the medicine. So uh, in these little packets that Michelle was talking about, you add water to it, shake it up, and there's enzymes that actually destroy the, the medication. So it's harmless at that point. Did I miss anybody? Go ahead. <clears throat> the question is what about surrounding states with background checks or the pharmacy? The prescription monitoring programs are in, they are all active except for Missouri. And Missouri has slowly come along, and I think there's certain subgroups that they are monitoring. I'll tell you what I think should be done, and of course this is should means ought to, but not necessarily will. Uh, it really ought to be federal. I mean, it ought to be run by the DEA and federal funds, and it ought to be anybody in the system. You fill a script in California, and I'm going to know about it in Kansas. I think that would have a huge chilling effect. Um, as it is, some of the systems will interact with each other, but it's not across the country, and it's not everybody. So it's, a, it's tricky and inadequate right now, but it's better than where we were 10 years ago. So, Yeah, Bill? Yeah, the question is, uh, from veterinary practices serving as, as a source, I know that's one thing that the Board of Veterinary Medicine has asked me about, and yeah, that's real, and, and it's being paid attention to. I've heard of several veterinary practices that were shut down, um, <clears throat> and again, that's kind of two ways. So, you know, uh, your dog Spot is having some sort of surgery, and here's 50 um, Percocet. Well, my, my uh, vet doesn't do that, so I think they, they are getting more serious about it. But certain parts of the country, I know that vets were serving as, um, as actual sources. They just you know, handing it out more or less. All right. Well, I'm happy to be open to questions. Michelle knows how to get hold of me most of the time. <laughs> and if you have questions, do please feel free to, to yell. Thanks so much. So um, I'm glad we were able to have another topic uh, to talk about, and I really encourage you, like I said earlier, to put down if you are, uh, there are other topics, substance abuse-related topics, crime-related topics, what have you. Uh, vaping is a big deal in, in Shawnee County, and I know the health department is actively working on that, and it's, uh, kids are using uh, e-cigarettes more than they're using regular cigarettes. That may be a topic, but we want to start engaging the conversation on the linkage between substance abuse and crime and all of the other things, and this is a good venue to be able to do that, and that's really how Safe Streets started, is trying to address reducing 
substance abuse through crime prevention. Um, I will highlight on the back of the, the, the piece that we have just developed, it does talk about some of the places where you can dispose of drugs. And um, Eric talked about this little packet. Um, I'm working with a collaborative group that involves Vallejo and Stormont Vale, KU, the VA, Family Service and Guidance Center, um, and a whole group. We've been, it's, it's, we've just renamed ourselves the Shawnee County uh, Prescription Drug Collaborative, and we work together to get a grant to provide. We've got 5,000 of these vials, and what they are is basically, it looks like you know when you put um, uh, flavoring in water, they're little packets, and um, Foundation for Me Foundation for Medical Care is putting together an information sheet, and we're going to be distributing this to the hospitals and Vallejo Family Service and Guidance Center, and a, an unusual suspect is part of our partnership, and it's um, uh, Penwell Gable. How many of you have had a loved one pass and they have all these prescription drugs and you don't know what to do with them? So they're also gonna be providing information at all of their funeral homes and some of these packets as well. So um, just another kind of you know, it, 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 it involves everybody to be involved, and there's a lot going on. You ask about why are we doing a good job. Um, about two and a half years ago, the hospitals got together and said, let's make sure that we have the same pain agreements with people who have chronic pain and are using opioids. And that started with just kind of the hospitals together, and it's grown into this other um, collaborative work that, that's been responsible for helping us with this. So with that, if you don't have any questions, we'll... Oh, Yes. Right, and we put that on the back. So, um, yeah, so there are options, and please share this information because I think a lot of people just don't know. And that will help reduce prescription drugs that aren't being used and can be abused with other folks. So, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in the lobby, there's a space for it, yeah. And it's just, um, I don't think all Walgreens have it. I know the one at 10th and Topeka Boulevard, and does the one on, yeah. But they, you know, it's, I think they're a 24, 24 hour. 10th and what? 10th uh, and Topeka is, yeah. So it's not everywhere. And then the DEA has take back days, um, twice a year and with these other vials and more education hopefully and you can also put them in coffee grounds but the thing about these packets they deactivate it so it isn't a concern with landfills and such so all right with that thank you very much for coming today and appreciate you coming and we'll hope to see you in August because we won't have a July meeting so take care